So good morning everybody. I think it's uh, 15 to 11 and we can start. Thank you for everyone coming to this room. I understand this is a busy event. There's a lot of people here, a lot of interesting sessions. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Janne Kalil from Exove who invited me here into this event and uh, I'm very happy to be, be around and uh, have this short talk. So I was asked to talk about uh, legal issues today and uh, about the interaction between legal stuff and business stuff. And that's what I'm going to talk about. I have two main topics here. You have them here. I'm talking about GPL license. How does that affect business? And I'm talking about patents. Just two, two issues here today. Something in my background first. So I'm actually not part of this community like I believe most of you guys are. This is my first time in a Drupal event. I'm really surprised how big this community is and uh, how active it seems to be. I've been working with uh, many open source projects in the past, not just with Drupal. I started like over 10 years ago as a consultant. Uh, maybe the first project that I consulted was uh, MySQL database. Back then there was no company even for that project, late 1990s. I had my own companies as well. Uh, I've done database applications, music uh, streaming services. Uh, latest company I'm having for the last almost five years already is called Tuxera. This talk is not an advertisement of Tuxera in any way. And what I do in these companies is not related to Drupal also, but it's a software company. We do file system software, uh, Linux system software based on open source. And now we are doing it in a commercial fashion. And we have to also, in our company, Tuxera, we have to deal with GPL and patents every day. And we have to figure out how can we use this uh, licensing and uh, patent stuff uh, as our, our benefit and not, a, not as uh, the limit for our business. So, okay, many things I, I, I talk about today may not exactly apl apply in your context and in your situation and uh, you hope understand that I'm coming from a different background but also hopefully I can offer you some new perspectives. Okay let's start. That was the disclaimer. Uh, there's two parts of my presentation. First is kind of the challenges part and then there's the opportunities part. Challenges. What challenges you have with GPL and patents? Here you have it, GPL license version 2, section 2B. You probably all have heard about this. Maybe some of you have even read this, this part from the license. The wording is a little bit different, GPL version 3, but the principle is the same. It's called copyleft. You must close any work that you distribute or publish that in whole or in part contest or is derived from the program or any part thereof to be licensed as a whole at no charge, free of charge, <coughs> to all third parties under terms of this license. What does this mean? Can you do software business anymore? Of course, if you develop a website, you know, it most likely doesn't affect you. You are not uh, doing traditional software. However, uh, if you think about the possible business models and possible things you could do, for example, with the, with the Drupal, uh, this certainly does affect what you can do if you want to make a business out of what you do. You can start just, you know, close source Drupal, make some extensions, and start selling the whole thing. It's against GPL. You have to dig a little bit deeper and figure out how to, how to get away from this limitation if this is a limitation for your business. But this is a really important part. It's the key part of GPL license. And uh, it, it affects everybody working with GPL software, including everybody working, working with Drupal. Uh, one more thing I'd like to say about this GPL versus 3. I understand Drupal is licensed with GPL versus two, version 2 or, or later. So you can choose if you want to have GPL version 2 or version 3, if, if you have that choice or you need to make a choice in some context. Uh, how I see licensing in this, let's say, IT industry in general, 
Many companies have internal policies against GPL version 3. It's not good for them. Many companies today, and I believe in the future. I don't think JPL versus version 3 has been a great success from business perspective. For many communities and, and community developers, it's, it's probably very much good and OK. Uh, but uh, let's say the big businesses have been very careful in adopting JPL version 3. So if you have a customer asking what version of GPL this thing has been licensed with, you make a local installation for your customer, most likely you should answer GPL version 2 if you don't know what to answer. That's at least what I would say. GPL version 3 can be, can be seen as a, as a threat. Another major challenge. Here is a, uh, one uh, patent document retrieved from a European patent database. There's a lot of patents. You have probably heard about them, read about them on, online, and uh, maybe sometimes even bumped to a patent claim or patent threat. This particular patent, there's millions of them. You can see the number somewhere, application number. It counts in millions these days, tens of millions these days. Date of filing, 94, long time ago. Common namespace for long and short file names. This is one of those almost legendary FAT, FAT file system patents. This is a really valuable patent. This patent has been litigated many, many times in courts. It has been found valid. Microsoft has been litigating against a lot of these Android phone manufacturers based on this patent, and they have been successful. There's a lot of patents like that in very many different areas of, of IT. You can, you can browse the patent databases, commentaries on them, a lot of blogs write about these patents. And uh, yeah, you should be aware patents exist. And sometimes they may actually bump into what you are doing. And actually, OK, a little bit about what we do in our company is that we are actually working in this particular file system context. And these kind of patents are really important for our business. We have to take care, of, care about these patents. The good news is that you can, you can uh, you can work still, even if patents do exist. You just have to contact the patent owner and figure something out. OK, one more thing about these patents is that um, there's been this ongoing debate in, deep debate in, in, in Europe about software patents. And uh, especially many community developers have been thinking that, OK, patents don't exist in Europe. But this is not true. It absolutely is not true. Basically, the same patents that are valid in the US have been you know, also successfully litigated in, in European courts. This is one example, this FAT patent. This is exactly the same patent registered in the United States and in Europe, litigated in the United States and in Europe, and successfully enforced uh, in both places. OK, one more challenge ahead. Maybe you have patents ahead if you do business and become successful. Oh, there's a lot of text here. Uh, this is what GPL says about patents. But this might be also relevant. Uh, from GPL version 2, the main point here is that uh, you know the couple of principles. You can't charge anything, and you have to be able to distribute it for everybody. If there are patents, GPL version 2 says, GPL version 3 goes even a little bit further. GPL version 2 says you can't distribute the software anymore if there are patents which are uh, out there and somebody asks royalties for those. If as a consequence even somebody alleges patent infringement, conditions are imposed on you, somebody asks royalties that contradict the conditions in this GPL license, meaning totally free redistribution, somebody has patent royalties, they do not excuse you from GPL. And as a consequence, you may not distribute the program, this GPL program at all. Somebody comes out and says, hey, Drupal infringes 10 of our patents. They are here. We ask royalties for this. Does it mean your Drupal business is over? 
you read this text maybe, maybe this is a this is a valid concern maybe it's a valid concern uh, just one example here uh, a company that uh, and there are many of these that uh, just go boldly where they they want to go to has anybody here heard of this yolla company all the Finns have heard, but okay, I understand that not, not many other, other, other guys have heard about it. So back in the day, there was this company called Nokia in Finland, and uh, they were developing a Linux-based operating system for their phones called Migo. Uh, they canceled it a couple years ago, switched to Microsoft Windows, and now their whole business has been sold to Microsoft. But when they were still strong, they developed a Linux-based operating system. They canceled that, and the guys who were developing it founded their own company called Yolla. And actually, now they plan to published the first Yolla phone end of this year. So just a company out of the blue, couple of guys, they want to start selling a new mobile phone based on a new Linux-based platform. This is a bold move if you think how many patterns you have in telecommunications sector and how many patterns you have affecting phones. You just think about all these Android lawsuits out there. Uh, okay, well, again, a lot of text here. Some of the news releases I just found online and uh, copied here. This guy Hurmola, I, I don't think he actually is anymore the CEO, but he was the CEO at some point of that company, and uh, he says that, hey, this Yolla Linux-based phone, we're going to sell it to everybody all over the world. It's a very good choice for <clears throat> manufacturer if you want to brand it as your own phone because we are not affected of these patents. We are based on an independent operating system, doesn't infringe patterns do you think this is a uh, strong ground they are they are getting forward forward with of course not i don't think this uh, this statement is actually actually so strong you know most of these android patterns they are about the internal functions of the of the operating system and i think this yolla operating system most likely infringes most of the same patterns that are part of the android lawsuits of course there are some ui patterns they don't probably infringe but uh, there are many others they could and just that you manufacture a phone you have to license a lot of patterns for 3g lte and other standards on a more positive note the thing the other quotation here that's from one of the famous peer-to-peer lawsuits and uh, judgment from the United States and there the judge is asking you can generalize that to all kind of IT businesses all right somebody starts a very interesting new technology company necessarily you have to infringe a lot of third-party rights copyrights patents for whatever in this case there was a massive cop copyright infringement ongoing basically the guy started the peer-to-peer -peer network but the judge is asking, hey, our society needs new companies. We need new businesses. It looks like necessarily you do infringe a lot of rights when you start an innovative company. How much time you get to grow big enough so you can start paying out? I think that's a valid question. And I think that's the right approach. And I actually think the approach these guys are having in this Finnish company, the mobile phone company, I, I like that attitude. Maybe they know the patterns exist. They don't exactly know where they apply to. They just go ahead. They see what happens. I think that's the way we should start thinking about these uh, difficult copyright and patent questions. And that brings me to the opportunity part. So how do you deal with uh, GPL and patents? Let's start with this GPL. So there was this issue that uh, how can you build a business based on GPL that makes everything free, free of charge? Different ways to look at this, but uh, I think the most obvious answer how GPL doesn't affect your business is you just build some kind of cloud service. And my understanding is that uh, there are very many companies also here making business out of Drupal this way. It's based on what the GPL language here says that, okay, you must cause any work that blah, blah, blah. 
distributor publish. Those are the keywords. Distributor publish. You have to actually distribute your software to somebody else. But as long as the software is in your own hands or only at the hands of your customer hosted somewhere, it's not distributed or published in the way GPL says, says about this, this thing. And at that point, uh, you haven't distributed it. Uh, you are not under the GPL terms that you should give it free of charge to everybody. So just host the code, modify it as much as you want, and sell access to your service. Sell access to your website, whatever it is. Make, make, a, make an online component uh, that can be integrated with other sites. If it's online, HTTP, you're very fine. That's not distribution. And of course, it's a big trend in computing. GPL doesn't affect this uh, cloud service business model in any, any way. I think this is the biggest uh, cloud business today. I'm not sure about it, but, but my, my belief and uh, gut feeling is that this must be one of the biggest businesses. These guys are working exactly under GPL, this limitation here. I think this Amazon Web Services is pretty much based on Linux, pretty much based on open source components. You can buy from them today pretty much everything. Computing power, uh, operating system, platform, components, over the cloud, even individual software component access. Uh, everything through access fees. That's fine. It's just on Amazon servers, not locally hosted. You don't get the software into your own servers. You will never get it because of GPL. They have been modifying the Linux and all the components so much they will never want to distribute those further. They will keep them. That's their competitive advantage. And I think this is a very valid model. And you know, cloud is a big trend. You see it uh, pretty much everywhere. You just have to figure out how can you make a service that can start competing with, uh, with for example, what these guys do or what these guys can do today. Well, that's a, that's a tall order. That's a tall order. And I understand in this Drupal community, there's also like a lot of other kind of uh, uh, access and cloud-based cloud services running and growing fast. Here's another part. Uh, and I understand this is much more controversial than the first one. Component licensing. And you look at the GPL, it says you have to give your software free of charge to everybody if it in whole or in part contains or is derived from, according to GPL version 2. Okay. This is something you have to read very carefully. Uh, but what, ha what has happened in many other contexts, I understand maybe not in the Drupal context, at least at this point, is that... Uh, there's an active component market, for example, on Linux. Linux is GPL version 2 license. There's many commercial components and apps running on Linux. So in principle, reading the GPL, don't think Drupal yet, you could develop plugins, apps, rewrite the whole platform or part of it, make commercial extension, and license those. Closed source proprietary charging money for that, the third parties. I think GPL allows that. And in many other contexts, it has been determined it's, it's very fine. You can then do your licensing business there. You can do the Microsoft model here, Oracle model. That scales. It's a very good business model, true, tried, tested. Actually, in our company, Tuxera, we use pretty much this model. We do components for Linux. We charge, charge for those like we do for any kind of software. Another way to try, to try to strengthen your position if you're in the component business is to try to figure out if you can uh, patent something for your component. Then you have even stronger arguments that, you know, this GPL can't apply to my component. Uh, I have a patent for it. So let's keep this GPL part and the component part, which is under patents, as separate. That's the idea and principle here. 
Okay, if I go to the Drupal Org website and uh, check the licensing section there, I can see that this particular community has a little bit different approach to commercial <coughs> extensions, modules, plugins, themes, however you call them. If I write a model or a theme, do I have to license under GPL? There were some other questions in the in a similar fashion. That can I can I write a bridge that you know I can then uh, have a commercial component plugged into Drupal? Can I build this kind of commercial API interface? And the answer is always the same. It has to be under GPL. Forget about commercial licensing in this this context. This is what they say. Drupal modules and themes all kind of plugins and whatever there was, bridge components are derivative work of Drupal. The GPL on code applies to code that interacts with that code. Now they are talking about these modules and extensions. If the modular extension interacts with the main Drupal code, that's enough. You have to be under GPL. When distributing your own modular theme, therefore GPL applies to any pieces that directly interact with parts of Drupal that are under the GPL. When I was checking these CMS systems, content management systems, I found that, for example, WordPress has a little bit different approach. There were websites where you, where you can buy commercial WordPress components. I actually remember when we built a website for this current company I'm having, we did license some WordPress components for, for that website. But for Drupal, at least if, if you look at what is said in this uh, licensing FAQ, this is, this is very much against the community norms here. Do you know who has written this text? Does anybody know? Where does this come from? Richard Stallman. Richard Stallman? I don't think so. This is from Drupal Org. Oh, okay. <laughs> Who, who's running this Drupal Org? Who is writing this text? No idea. Because what I was left wondering is that this kind of text must serve the purpose of somebody and the goals of somebody. Now, if you look at what the GPL said, it said that in whole or in part, contains or is derived from. This is legal, legal language. It links you to the concept of derivative works, which is a concept in copyright law. And that concept has been then, you know, clarified in a number of legal cases. And how the Drupal community FAQ interprets this text is that GPL applies to anything that interacts. Now interaction, I think, is much more broad that being a, you know, something that is derived from contains. Contains basically means you copy code. If you copy GPL code and, you know, copy paste it as part of your own program, then you are derived, then you must be under GPL. But if you just interact without copying any code, this goes a couple more steps further. And I don't think this kind of interpretation at least it's not based on copyright law, it's based on something else. I think it's based on uh, somebody in the community having this approach, like you said, Richard Stallman is having. Richard Stallman wants to build a free society. He hates proprietary software. He wants to read the law in a way that there is no proprietary software out there. He doesn't care what the right interpretation of the law is. He's like, uh, Okay, I don't want to say what Richard Stallman is, but let's say the ideology behind, you know, this kind of language is, is more like, uh, it's like more like pro-life. While the way it should be read is like pro-choice. You can choose. So I don't know who has written that, but uh, I think it goes, goes further than, uh, than copyright law. Now, what does it mean in practice? Uh, I think there's uh, been like a long time already, but a couple last years, many, for example, mobile platforms have become really successful because they have been able to build ecosystem around the platform. And by ecosystem, 
a very key component has been uh, enabling kind of commercial app development. Okay, in other context, you have this iTunes App Store, Google Play, a lot of games there and all kind of crappy apps, but also like functionality, utilities, and uh, even extensions to the, to the platform. It's very important you have this kind of app stores. The community here, okay, run by a company, different thing, enables, helps people to develop apps. Everybody can make money out of those. While in this Drupal community, I see kind of very negative approach to these kind of apps. I don't understand why. If this community thinks that, you know, it's a, this cheap license problem, then I think the community should themselves build some kind of commercial API so you can commercially extend Drupal. I think it would be good for the whole community. Or maybe I have understood something wrong here, but uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is a concern I was having. I didn't fully understand why this community is so, so negative against uh, commercial extensions. Is there somebody here you can, who can uh, clarify this thing? I won't send any patches if it's a closed commercial proprietary module. So that's the power of the Drupal, right? That everybody can, can debug issues and contribute. Yeah, I, I fully understand. That's the power that is open. But what if somebody wants to you know, make the module commercial? What does this community have against this guy? I think it still like, uh, makes the community kind of stronger. An example is Linux community. There's a lot of commercial extensions to the Linux kernel. And for example, Linus Turvas has always said that he's like an open hyper. He's totally like, he has no moral, moral points here. And it's okay. You can extend it uh, in GPL way or even, even commercial way. You just keep the arm's length and uh, follow the GPL. But this community, whoever wrote these guidelines, seems to, seems to be more in the lines of Richard Stallman. Yes. Plugins. Just by seeing the difference of the community itself and how they work together, uh, I think this has a lot to do with it. The fact that you cannot just branch out and start um, developing your own system, basically. Mm. Um, and it influences more the community than the actual technical aspect of it. Yeah, I, I fully believe that the communities must be then different between WordPress community and Drupal. And part of the reason I think is rooted in this kind of language and answer the FAQ and uh, yeah, it's a different community, and I, I guess one of the answers to somebody who wants to develop a commercial extension is go to WordPress community. Maybe I know the wrong context. Yeah, you have a couple of legal, legal commercial points to that. First of all, is that copyright law requires the, the act of copying in order to be effective. So then using or interacting cannot infringe the copyright law. And the other thing is that even if you don't follow the GPL rules, you need somebody to sue it and have a budget for suing you and only then it becomes a problem. So commercially you can do whatever you want as long as no, there is not a somebody with a budget that will sue you for doing that. Yeah, I fully agree with you. I was, uh, yeah, I fully agree that, you know, this interaction, that's not part of copyright. And, you know, there should, nobody should have a, have a valid claim even if you, if you extend it commercial. I'm just wondering why somebody wants you to think that it's a problem. What's for wrong with this community? Yeah. For example, um, you do a Drupal module for interacting with PayPal to do payments, is it supposed that PayPal has to be GPL? Oh, well, definitely not. I, I think what, what is being thought about here is that you actually write lo locally, locally hosted code, this kind of component, P PSP code or something. Yeah, but Interacts is so broad. I mean, in today's world, Yeah, okay, if, if you think really broadly. I don't think the guy who wrote this can think like, you know, any, any online accessible components or stuff or where you, you interface with HTTP would be under this language. I don't, I don't think they, they yeah. think that broadly. But okay, you can actually read it like that, yes. If you just read the text and think yourself and, hey, this, this would need some clarification. That's at least my conclusion here. Okay. Uh, yeah, so what's wrong with this uh, approach? I don't see anything wrong here. The, I think this would strengthen the community if there would be an app store on top of the platform. Maybe somebody can take an initiative. Well, they 
don't exclude each other, you can have an app store and have the current uh, situation in Drupal. I fully agree with you. So why there is no app store? Why there is this language on the on the website? Oh, it's a mistake. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, maybe. I, I don't think it's a mistake. I think it's a very, very carefully thought, of, thought you know, thing. It's, it's exactly according to what this Richard Stol Stolman <laughs> thinks and, uh, yeah. All right, that was just my observation and uh, I was left wondering what this whole thing is about. <clears throat> I'll just the guilty ones are not in this room. They would have been definitely a good defense for the language. Okay. So what business models are left here? Uh, always you can do processing. Understand this is the main business model in this community and GPL has nothing to do when you're selling hours and uh, projects. You develop the website for a customer. You do custom work, that's very fine. And if you distribute the code to your customer, then if you did any changes according to GPL, you have to release the code if somebody comes after you and ask about the ask about the code. The challenge with this model is that does it scale? The companies I see in this community, this is a very large community, maybe one of the most active and, and biggest open source communities today is that the many, many of the companies in this community, commercial, whatever project you have here, are quite small scale still today. Probably because the business model is not scalable. If you sell projects, it doesn't scale well. Here is how it scales. You need to have a lot of people to work on these projects. And there are already companies like, like I don't know, IBM. There was Capgemini here, Accenture, other consultancy companies. They have these, you know, cubicles. You go to India, it's like uh, this picture 100 times. China, same thing. There's a lot of people out there. They can do very cheap consultancy work. If this grows bigger, I think the guys who have the cubicles ready have the advantage. So that's the challenge with this, this model. Not GPL, but how does it scale? But okay, you can, you can run your small shop, scale it to 5, 10, 20, 50 people, no problem have your local market, but uh, to scale it really big, that's the, that's the challenge. I think it's really hard to build a new Microsoft here or even new MySQL here. That's really hard. Uh, yeah, I, I understand Drupal Founders Company could be one of the biggest, but still that one is not like, uh, at least at this point, not another Microsoft. Okay. That was a part of GPL. Uh, then a couple more points about uh, patents. <clears throat> Maybe I already touched upon this topic, so, okay, there's a lot of patents and uh, the more you read about them, the more you can you, go, you know, become concerned about patents. Uh, you can find a patent that looks like it applies to your project looks like that applies to exactly what you are doing. You can hear about these patent lawsuits, threatening stories, sad stories about what happened when you got a patent lawsuit or even a patent threat. But at the end of the day, do you personally know somebody else? For example, in this community who have received even a threat of patent infringement. Is there somebody in this room that has heard about this kind of patent threat? Anybody? You have heard. Yeah, because I'm married to a patent attorney. <laughs> okay. There, there you go. There you go. Okay. But was it in this context? It was in, no, it was not in Drupal community. Okay. Right. Yeah, the important thing about these patents is that as long as you are in a you know, community of uh, companies with 50 people or less, this is not the community and context where you litigate patents or even threat with, uh, with patent claims, anybody. There's a lot of talk, but it's, talk is cheap. You can always hear about these uh, patents and there's a lot of uh, 
online forums and threads where people are talking about patterns and thinking how bad they are, how harmful they are for society. You can't develop software anymore. But at the end of the day, I don't think there's anybody in this comedy who should be concerned about patterns too much. There's too much talk about them. Yes. Well, I kind of disagree because the salespeople should, because it's the big, big customers who will be uh, threatened by patent lawsuits. And they are prepared for it, of course. But if you can somehow make them believe that your code doesn't infringe any patents, they will pay more to you because they, they save on their risk for doing it. They, you can never indemnify them. You will be bankrupt before the first law uh, sitting in the, in the, in the court, but uh, th they kind of calculate the patent risk onto everything they, they do. And if you can convince them that this is lower risk than something else, then uh, they, they basically are able to pay you more. And I think uh, anything open source is very good for that because generally open source solutions are not litigated against because it creates so much bad will that large corporations are not very willing to do so. Yeah, thanks. That's a very good, uh, you know, follow-up comment on this. I was thinking this from the perspective that if you want to, you know, start your shop and develop your own software, should you be concerned about patents? And my answer is no. But yes, if you're going to sell your software to some very large company that uh, works internationally in many markets, especially in the United States, those companies always look at their, you know, risk position, including potential to, you know, infringe anybody's patents. And whenever they buy something that costs a lot of money or even that is relevant for their business, it doesn't cost so much, they always ask, so is there a potential we infringe somebody's patents? And they want from their supplier to sign a, some kind of agreement where they in, uh, indemnify this big company. Basically, you, you sell them an insurance as part of the delivery, usually free of charge. You can't charge more. You have to insure them. The best of our knowledge, there's no patents, and if there are, I pay the cost for litigation. Uh, the thing is that, I don't know, you probably have seen the patent databases and there are those claims that are just huge and very difficult for a human to uh, just, you know, read them all. And the thing is that the amount, the thousands or maybe even tens of thousands of patent attorneys that you would need to litigate against like a 50 uh, person company is just huge in the present. But that doesn't mean that like in 50 years from now, in 100 years from now, that we won't have that technological ability. And if we do so, then we're effectively killing innovation. Uh, because like you can only do stuff that is like 20 years behind, which is the average lifespan mm. of a patent. Um, that's my first thing. And the other one is much broader, which is like, uh, patents are supposed to be for tangible goods that can have to be like uh, made industrially and I just don't see how software patents even fit that and it seems odd that there are software patents at all for me so mm -hmm. that's why I was so curious about to hear your take on that. Well, I, I, my take is very practical. Uh, first of all, like the, the latter part of your question is, is very good point, and it's the philosophical point that can, first of all, software be patented? It's a very, very valid question. And uh, I think many people would answer negative. No, you shouldn't be able to patent software. However, my perspective is practical, and I can yeah. see software is patented and it's not going away. There will be more software patents. So from practical perspective, that question is, is not relevant, actually. It's a philosophical question you can, you can ask over a beer, okay. The first part of your point was, uh, the, you know, the distant future that are we building this kind of wrong kind of society? It was also, I understand, a bit social, the question that 50 years from now you are in a different position, but uh, hey, we are living today and... Uh, yeah, but right, so I, I also, also have this kind of, I, my, my first day is very short-sighted maybe here, yeah. maybe I'm wrong.
Oh, we don't use Drupal, sorry you about it. Open source, right? Yes. Um, do you talk to the users? Yeah, we have contributed a lot. Okay, because I mean, just like listening to this session, it, it was almost like a uh, how do we uh, exploit open source to uh, further our commercial interest is the feeling that I'm getting in the session. How do we use patents to, mm -hmm. uh, to protect our, our, our components from GPL, etc.? Mm -hmm. Uh, I understand where you come from, and uh, I'd like to come back to this, uh, how, how, I, how I phrase these words, that uh, the community, like, like how you describe it, it's like it's pro-life. The, the principle is really the important yeah, I thing. Think, yeah. I think that's mm. disingenuous uh, analogy that you're making, mm. because um, Richard Stallman, you mentioned, mm -hmm. and Free Software Foundation, yeah. yes, they have morals and they have ethics attached to their license and to their philosophy. What Tim, Tim O'Reilly did uh, 20 years ago, stripping their morality and ethics from it to create open source, was a good move for businesses, of course, because like you were saying, it made it patent uh, palatable to them. But I don't think there's anything essentially wrong with having a certain level of morals and ethics in what we do. That, is, that shouldn't be incompatible with commercial considerations necessarily going forward. I think that creates the kind of commercial world that we live in today, um, which isn't entirely always in our best interest, I think, in terms of compatibility. But I, I think that the, you are now uh, putting your own morals and ethics, that, the, that we all should follow those, instead of that uh, if I want to exploit open source, I should be free to do so, if the license allows it. If the, if the license is wrong, if the society is wrong, then you go vote and change things. But uh, I, and if the, if the community expels me, that's the price that I have to pay. But we should not we should not stop talking about these things because if somebody thinks that they are unethical, because they are still valid things in the sense of the law, current laws, and that's the point. Oh, definitely, definitely. And, and that, that's why it's it's good to good to hear. I I, I invited Mikko here that they, we we hear something else than the echo chamber. We hear something that we don't like. Well, I don't know the Drupal community either, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah, but, but, chain yeah, but anyhow, yeah. that the that the uh, it's it's more that we that there are different ways to build the community, like WordPress, like the like the Apple has the communities. Some make money, some don't make money. Whether it's uh, sort of uh, pro money or pro what it would be pro code in a sense or, or something else, it, those are choices that we have made in the community, but uh, at least for me it's refreshing to hear that there are different options and different ways to move forward, and if somebody thinks that it's, they are exploited, somebody else might say this is just really lucrative business. <coughs> and I, I, I suggest that we let Mikko to continue to the end that... Alright, I'll just wrap, wrap up. I, I understand this kind of talk. I, I'm controversial, yes. I, I understand I'm in a, in a hostile territory. At least some of you might think like him. And I, I fully appreciate your points. Uh, I'd like to be a better person myself and a politician. I'm not a Jesus, unfortunately. So I, I'm just a... I'm, these days I'm a CEO. I'm a business guy. I, I, I think... I, I'm, I'm a cr close partner to Microsoft also. My, my thinking has been influenced by Microsoft patent attorneys a lot in the recent years. So. That's where I come from. That's what I what I what I'm I am. Okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway, about these patents and the litigation. So what's what's happening today? And uh, the, my main argument was here that if you're doing a small shop based on a you know Drupal open source CMS, most of the patent stuff doesn't affect you. They are the big guys like Microsoft and others in consumer electronics space. They are litigating a lot of patents, uh, and uh, those. If you call them patent warheads, they are not actually targeted at innovation. They are targeted at money, at deep pockets. <coughs> That's what we are seeing there. Um, and another point here is that what these patents actually cover. Okay, like my approach is that the patents are there, they exist, they are not going away, no, no matter what we do. 
you know, okay, one part of my history was that uh, I founded an organization called Electronic Frontier Finland, a part of this uh, kind of a similar than EFF in, in Finland. That was like 12 years ago. I went to the parliament, I advocated against patents, I, I, I went to the European parliament, I was there with Ritsa Storm and the same panel, advocating against patents 10 years ago. I found out this doesn't work, we never win this war. I gave up, I went to do this business. And what I'm thinking, like uh, looking at these patents and talking with these patent attorneys from the speaker companies is that uh, actually the, the kind of area of valid strong patents is very narrow. And they are almost always well known. The same patents are litigated time and again, like this fat file system patent, which is a kind of strong patent. But you can almost like list those areas and almost list the patents that are valid and good. You, you, can, you can think that there's many patents in media, codex, MP3, good example. Everybody knows about the MP3 patent and many other codecs are, are patented, okay? DRM, this, uh, you know, digital restriction management, to use, uh, Free software guide terminology. File system storage technologies, compression security algorithms. Those areas have strong patents and you should be concerned about them. But then again, there are many areas where the patents are really weak. And I think this uh, content management system in general, user interface related stuff is an area of weak patents. Uh, there are also something called registered design, design patents in the United States. Register design rights in Europe. Uh, you can, you can, you know, try to get an exclusive right for your user interface and functionality there. But these are not strong patents. It means that uh, you can circumvent them pretty easily. Good example is this one. Just one example. Okay, it's a, it's a patent. I think uh, both uh, both in uh, in the United States, a registered design in Europe filed and uh, not sure if it's still valid, but most likely it is. But can you circumvent that? I think many people here can figure out quite quickly some other way to, you know, do the same functionality. What is registered here is exactly this kind of mechanism and this kind of graphics and uh, this kind of stuff. And there are many, many similar stuff. You know, Apple basically these days, they register every kind of screenshot from iPhone. The, uh, you know, opening screen. All the, all the icons, they are registered designs. You can exactly copy them. But if you think you can, you can circumvent this, you can have another mechanism. You know the, how Android phone opens. There's all kind of stuff you can do there to make it open, not just this kind of slide to unlock. And that's totally fine. This is a weak patent, a weak design right. Okay. Final point about patents. Again, I understand this might be controversial to some of you. What if you think of in a different way about these patents and, and design rights? This means you step, you know, to the different side of the table. You think about could we acquire own, you know, strong registered rights here. Compared to this litigation, which is really expensive and only the big companies are doing that, Actually, smaller shops can file patents and you can register your designs with relatively modest cost, like 10, 20,000, you can have a patent. If you have very good, strong patents and designs, I think your company can be more valuable. If you're looking for getting investment, if you're looking to sell your, your company, if you have a company with patents or registered design, it's always more valuable than a company without any any strong IP. And okay, having that kind of rights, I want to repeat this thing. It doesn't mean you're going against the community. You can decide what you do with your registered designs or your patents. You can license them free of charge for the community. You can try to get money from other, other, other companies. You can try, try that approach when you are trying to, you know, develop commercial extensions. Don't mix with GPL version 3. That's problematic with patents though. Use GPL version 2. But that's one approach. And you know, if you limit your mind to this kind of free software thinking, you don't even consider this option. But if you free your mind, if you think pro-choice, here's one approach you can take. Okay, there are many, many 
companies like uh, that I just found this website that uh, lists patent valuations. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure myself how successful or how important this company is, but the, uh, the, the data, data looks good. Okay, somebody's chatting, chatting to me. Same time. Uh, these guys list some of the recent uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions where patents were important in the merger and acquisition. Actually, this is a pure pure patent patent purchases here, and they are they are just counting the value of, of a patent, and they are all technology transactions. In general, about the uh, software or, or hardware, flash memory, inkjet printing, data transaction, e-commerce, document management. Average life, uh, average value of a patent is uh, more than two hundred thousand. It's not bad. You have five patents, your company value just went up one million, if those are okay patents. I don't think patents are evil. They exist. Yeah, yeah this is a final slide. This was a relay, you know, reference to the earlier slide where you started the, you know, finding gold and then you get the mine. I don't know if you get it through patents or what way you get it, but uh, yeah, this is of course the goal you want to reach. Okay, thank you. If there's any, any more questions, you are, you are free to go ahead. I mean, no <coughs> one discusses the importance of patents in uh, driving technological breakthroughs and supporting the innovation of many patents, but you were just talking about strong patents and weak patents, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that here no one is against strong patents. Stuff like new algorithms, uh, things that, you know, um, are important and are real breakthroughs. But now something that you described as a weak patent, in my views, they shouldn't be accepted at all by the institutes because they just drive confusion, they uh, expose many, many people who are doing honest work to like possible patent infringement and possible even bankruptcy. You might say that it doesn't happen very often that the, some big companies use uh, a small guy, but that's mostly because of PR. So it's not really a valid reason in my book so what's your thought on the amount of weak patents that are emerging uh, just so big companies can try to get to other companies big pockets as you have put it yeah I fully fully uh, you know support your idea that weak patents should be somehow you know driven out of out of existence, but uh, I don't know how to do that. The patent system seems to be very liberal, and uh, you know, patent offices allow a lot of weak and bad patents. That's 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 definitely a problem, and I think everybody agrees. And you should yourself what, be careful if you if you, you invest see, in patent. Don't don't do fire see, those uh, bad patents. As an, mm. uh, an improvement to mm. that system is it like the uh, technical competence of people. Uh, working at those patent offices or are, just, are they just dirty and want more fees or whatever? Well, that's so a really difficult, difficult question and uh, I don't have an answer to that one. There's a lot of talk about that in the, there's many proposals have been made and I, I don't know how to, how to fix the system really. That's, it's difficult to fix, but uh, that's a difficult uh, area, yeah. As a husband of a patent attorney, I'm uh, si sort of a semi-expert on this one, so the uh, Part of the part of the issue is that the the U.S. U.S. Uh, PTO. PTO is really lax on certain things. Uh, does not have competent people. It's getting better, but uh, allows a lot of lot of lot of crap through it. And the the U.S. Uh, model of litigation that they're going to the court is also a bit toxic. In that sense, uh, the ways how you can describe a simple solution for a simple problem that everybody can figure out that this is how it goes can be mass to a complex language that you don't 
actually understand it and then you when when you go to the lawsuits then the uh, then the uh, it, it, it comes problem and then the final thing that I see part of the problem that when you when you start to you make patents with engineers that you have engineers talking about these things that the, the patent examinator is engineer the uh, you are engineer the uh, patent attorney in certain countries engineer some other countries is a technical lawyer but when you start to litigate then you drop all of these to the background and the lawyers talk and they not they and the court they might even understand what the patent is at the end that how simple or how complex thing is it so the system is broken but nobody has the power to fix it so we just have to live with it sir you had a I comment yeah this is a simple question hmm. if you could go back in time and talk to tim berners lee and tell him everything that you told us to convince him to try and patent all of his work uh, where would he be today i would not recommend him to patent anything He's doing infrastructure stuff. That should be free of all IP. Okay, so the stuff that we can exploit should be free. Then we should build close things on, uh, on top of the open work that other people do. Is that your model? Don't, don't think like that. Uh, are you okay with, you know, commercial Linux applications? Oh, yeah, totally, exactly. But all right. um, I'm not okay with patents. Um, because mm. if we had had them for the truly innovative stuff, yep. we wouldn't be sitting here. I fully agree with that one. I agree. I agree. I, I want all infrastructure stuff, the really deep level stuff to be free. That's definitely what it should be. Web, web must be free. There's no doubt on that. Does that mean that you want other people to build the infrastructure for you in an open way so that you can build on top of that in terms of having... Uh, that's the bit that I find exploitative in your approach. Now, nothing else. Okay. I don't have anything against your commercialization of, of things. Okay, how I would see it as, you know, the state must provide us the roads, but cars must be, you know, private. That's how I see it. Right. But we pay for the roads through taxes. So should we pay for that infrastructure? But if we pay taxes, it doesn't mean that I have a free access to any car I want. You know, I, I can't have the keys to the car. Sorry about it. We don't pay taxes to Tim Berners-Lee right now. Maybe we should. Mm. But that, that's also a business okay. decision that it is... Uh, I think that the, the, there's a good case in the Bluetooth back in the 95, when it was in, uh, in Wydie, uh, invented by uh, Ericsson in Sweden. They made business calculation that they will earn more if they will give license to everybody for free. But they did patent it. And then they just said that, okay, we have patented it, and uh, we patent, probably they patented like Volvo did the, for the safety belts, that it's patented, but it's usable for everybody. Maybe the Swedes are so generous that they, they have a nice nice country that they, everything is fine and so forth. They have a lot of money, they don't have to care. But people like us coming from Finland, we have to care. So the, uh, anyhow, the you could do with the patent also so that you say that, okay, nobody can own this anymore because we own it and we give it free for everybody. So you can think of it in different ways. But Ericsson, make no mistake that Ericsson was not the benefit uh, benevolent innovator that just okay use this stuff but they made a calculation that we will earn more if everybody else uses this too and they made sure also that if they will most probably the I don't know the exact details but I guess that the most probably the uh, clause the clauses in the in the license that you license the Bluetooth is that you won't uh, you won't litigate against Ericsson that they covered their backs also in the same process because I would do that though anyhow uh, with, with advice from my wife that they are always always make sure that if you give the patent to somebody uh, you make sure that they don't attack you so it, it is more complex than the that whether whether it's a simple thing that the, if Tim Berners-Lee would have patented World Wide Web and give it to everybody without licenses and have a, have a that, that uh, he gives it to the public domain then there would be the world would have been different because they would be saying that okay, your invention actually infringes the, the double uh, this World Wide Web patent, and you can't litigate because you have licensed the World Wide Web from Tim Berners-Lee first. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it would be different, mm -hmm. and it could have been better, but we don't know. It probably wouldn't have been that big success that if Tim Berners-Lee would have licensed for everybody yeah. that using web is ten ten bucks. But the, the web is also so important. Mm -hmm because it's free, and free as in 
freedom, right? So uh, if it wasn't free, then it wouldn't be so widespread and so universal as, as it is today. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Uh, I would actually piggyback that comment slightly because there are fundamental infrastructure things that are for free, like IP or web, and there are some things that are paid for, like most wireless access networks, 3 c LTE, Wi-Fi, yeah. EDMA, you name it. And they're also widespread. Yeah, they're widespread, but CD they're not was universal. CD was really very Because there's competition automatically. Yeah. There's competition, so yeah, they, they can't be universal. Yeah, that's right. It, yeah, the, the, there will be competition if there's a price. Yeah, so of course. Mm. But it could be still thing. Yeah, yeah, of course. No one is questioning. <coughs> <coughs> okay. Thank you very much for your attention. I, I think we can we can close this uh, talk now. Thank you.